I've talked before in my videos about how much statistics and math you need for data science. Sometimes even, I make fun of how much academia hypes up machine learning. So this all begs a pretty natural follow-up question, which is, how much machine learning do you really need for data science? Keep watching and we'll discuss. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. Now I did a video a little while ago on machine learning books that I really recommend. Naturally, I'll have a link to that video in the description as well as Amazon links to those books. But reading books is not the only way that you can go about learning machine learning, obviously. A lot of people do love going that route, but there are things like Andrew Ng's famous Coursera course. You can go plug and play with different R or Python packages. There's lots of options out there. But let's just take a step back and think about what the most important parts of the machine learning process are in order to be a truly successful data scientist. Now I put this together by examining those books I recommend, how they're structured and what contents are in there, as well as my own personal experience. You'll find that with a lot of good machine learning books, they differ in things like what data and examples they use, how theoretical versus applied they are, and what programming language they utilize. But at the end of the day, they all do cover a lot of the same topics. And I am a firm believer with a lot of things. If you understand what it is that you need to learn in the first place, you're going to be in a much better position than most people. Now I'm gonna go through 10 different concepts in the machine learning universe that you should be familiar with. And now I'm not gonna have time in this video to go through full lengthy descriptions of each of these things or the video would be massively long, but who knows? Maybe even I could be convinced to do some separate videos on some of these topics. So before we get into all these topics, just a few usual asks. Number one, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already. The goal is 5,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Also, take half a second and smash the like button because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. And then if you guys would be willing to support me over on Patreon, I will have a link to that in the description and it would mean the world to me if you guys are willing to help me out that way. So one of the very first things that you should be familiar with is the difference between inference and prediction. And I have a full video on this topic already, complete with examples. Link will be in the description. Here's the short difference. So machine learning can be used to infer the effect that different variables have on some response variable. You might want to specifically estimate what the effect these variables have on the outcome, or you might not really care about that, you just care about what the most important variables are. Or alternatively, you might want to predict a particular outcome, given that outcome is well defined, and you have a set of other variables which can be used as predictors. The distinction between these two is absolutely critical because at the end of the day, there's really nothing more important than knowing the purpose of your analysis and knowing what problem you're trying to solve up front. But now that we're still on the subject of absolute fundamentals, another thing which it doesn't get a lot more fundamental than is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Put simply, let's say you have a problem where you have some kind of outcome of interest. It could be a regression or a classification problem where you're trying to predict that outcome, or your goal may be inference. It doesn't matter. As long as you do have that well-defined outcome up front, you've got yourself a supervised learning problem. But if you don't have an outcome variable, your goal may be just to create clusters in that data set, or you may want to do some kind of dimensionality reduction. But if you don't have that outcome, you've got an unsupervised learning problem. And these tend to be harder. Another key thing you need to understand is the bias-variance trade-off with an emphasis on the difference between overfitting and underfitting. I'll have a link to a StatQuest video that does a great job breaking down the difference between these two, but I'll also try to do it briefly here. If you have a model that's too complex, generally because there's too many variables in it, you're gonna have a model with low bias but high variance, meaning the model doesn't generalize well to a test set. In other words, your model is going to overfit. But then on the flip side, if your model is not complex enough, you're going to have high bias but low variance. In other words, the model is going to underfit. 
and there is no free launch. There is a trade-off between these two scenarios. So understanding that this trade-off exists and how to think about it is going to be really important. Now the next three items for this list all pertain to methods. And really, I'm dividing it based on methods for three different kinds of problems. And what I'll say to beginners who are just picking up machine learning for the first time is that you don't have to be a complete expert at these. With any method, I think it makes sense to understand at a high level how it works, what kind of problem it can be used to solve, how to implement it in a programming language of your choice, and then what the parameters are. But then later down the road, hey, the more theory that you understand behind that method, the better. First thing you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with is all the different regression methods. And that starts with the very simple linear regression. So this is gonna be amazing when you're working with a client that's not necessarily super math savvy and you want to explain your results. It works whenever you have a continuous outcome, but it's not necessarily the most powerful predictive model in the world by any stretch of the imagination. You can make the method more complex with various regularization techniques. You've got ridge regression, you've got the lasso, or you can put the concepts between these two together in what's called the elastic net. Then another extension of the regression approach that I'm a big fan of is partial least squares. And granted, you do have other techniques out there for attacking problems where you have a continuous response, but regression methods are by far the most well known. You probably guessed what the next item on this list is, and those are the techniques for when you're dealing with a categorical outcome, that is, classification methods. First method that most people are familiar with is logistic regression. So it has all the same benefits that linear regression has with respect to interpretability. You've got the same options for regularization, and it does have some wonderful extensions in the case where you have multiple outcomes, whether those are nominal or ordinal. But logistic regression is just scratching the surface of all the different classification methods out there. You've got decision trees, random forests, k-nearest neighbors, support vector machines, and of course everybody's favorite, which is the neural network. And now I do have to point out, all these things are, for the most part, primarily used for classification, but many of them do have extensions for regression problems as well. But then, of course, I would be remiss not to talk about techniques that you use for unsupervised learning problems. Now, you really do have to be specific and ask yourself what type of problem you're trying to solve when you embark on an unsupervised learning exercise. But probably the most common type of unsupervised learning problem is clustering. That is, you're trying to cluster the data set into two or three or four or however many different distinct clusters. Now probably the most common approaches for that are the k-means algorithm and hierarchical clustering. But your goal could also be dimensionality reduction, and to that end, a couple of the most common techniques are principal component analysis and factor analysis. But then another one I really like is t-stochastic neighbor embedding, or t-SNE. So all right now, suppose you use your method of choice and you get it working. A next Follow-up question that's pretty natural is, how do you measure your performance and evaluate how well you did? For supervised learning problems where you have a continuous response and your goal is prediction, the most common metric for evaluation is RMSE, that is root mean square error. Now granted, if your goal is inference, you're probably going to be a bit more interested in goodness of fit statistics, so things like adjusted R squared or AIC. But for classification problems, it gets a little bit more complex, and a lot of it does come down to the cutoffs separating your classes. So you have different metrics like sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value. And then you have curves like the precision recall curve, or the receiver operating characteristic curve, and the corresponding areas under these curves, which broadly speaking, summarize the quality of the model and how well it performs from a predictive standpoint. That metric of success is obviously highly critically important to just seeing how well you did. And with any luck, that's something that you establish up front before you write a single line of code. Now these last three things all pertain to different data-related issues that you are going to run into. The first, and 
a very common one, is class imbalance. This is the case where you're working with a classification problem, but the different classes of the outcome do not occur at anywhere near the same rate. Like maybe you have one class that occurs like 90% of the time, but the other one only occurs 10% of the time. Spoiler alert, this is the majority of real life classification problems. Because let's be real, suppose you're predicting somebody defaults on a loan or forecloses. That's not gonna happen 50% of the time. 50% of the time, people aren't going to get some disease that you're trying to predict. And there's some different things that you can do to try to alleviate this problem. One of them is to do some sampling up front to try to balance these class rates in both your training and test sets. Another thing you could do if you have only two classes is just to use alternative cutoffs. So what I mean by that is, rather than classifying something to the minority class if the probability is 0.5 or greater, maybe classify to that class if the probability is 0.2 or greater or something like that. That's essentially what you're observing with something like a precision recall or ROC curve. Or simply just try to maximize your accuracy for the minority class. That tends to work out a little bit better all around. So that item was all about the outcome variable. Now it's time to talk about the predictors. Specifically, we're going to talk about feature selection. And I did a whole video about why if you have bad data, you're going to have a bad model. So check that out. Link's in the description as always. Now, I'm a big believer in letting your domain knowledge handle the feature selection as much as possible, but obviously in some cases that's only going to take you so far. There are things like forward, backward, or stepwise selection for eliminating or adding features. And then also the caret package in R or the scikit-learn package in Python can help you perform recursive feature elimination, which is a more complex but incredibly powerful way of handling this. Now the last one is a topic that you could write an entire book about, and in fact, some have. There'll be a link to one in the description, but that's feature engineering. So let me explain this one with some examples. If you use the z-scores for some predictors instead of their raw values, that can make a huge difference. If you take the ratio between two predictors and you drop those raw predictors, that can make a huge difference. And often if you have a continuous variable and you discretize it, that is you bin it into two distinct classes, that can sometimes make a huge difference. This is a huge topic to end on. And like many of these other things, oftentimes the thing that's gonna guide you the most is your domain knowledge of the problem at hand. And many other times, it's technique specific. But having said all that, this can often be the part of the process that you spend the absolute most time on. So it's definitely something that should be on your radar. There you have it. That's 10 components of machine learning that you should be familiar with. Like I always say, this is not totally comprehensive, and what you do is going to vary a lot depending on your specific job. Like your job might not have you do any machine learning, or you might do so much machine learning that it makes a West Coast ML engineer blush. But I think these topics will get you off on a great start, and if you're just getting into data science and you know all these things, I think you're gonna do an amazing job. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider sharing it, subscribe, like, and leave me a comment down below and let me know what part of machine learning that you think is the most important. Then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard on data.